So let's go back to 2 degrees C. This all sounds quite depressing. Um, so is it still a viable goal? Well, I still think it is. Um, yeah, I said there's an outside chance of 2 degrees C. And if we're prepared to reduce our energy demand very significantly, then yes, then it is. Um, there are three things I'm going to touch on. The first was on equity and behavior. The second one is on technology. So technology has a big role to play. Remember, I've already, I'm not sure I did say, but I meant to say that the supply side is hugely important. We do need to do the, everything we can do in the supply, but it will take a long time to, become, to come to play and, and to significantly reduce our emissions. But the demand side technologies can offer a lot very early on indeed. And the third one we must start to think about seriously and address is this concept of growth. Um, I will touch on all of these. The first of these, uh, thanks to Chatsum and Piketty's work, I've got a bit more data behind my, my assumptions on this that I've been using for quite a few years. 50% of global emissions come from just 10% of the population. 50% of just 10% of the population. The top 1% of US emitters, which is about 3.5 million people there or thereabouts, have carbon footprints that are 2,500 times higher than the bottom 1% globally. Um, now, I'm making a bit of a guess that quite a few of us here in the top 10%, probably quite a few of us here in the top 1% of global emitters. So 2,500 times. So I just think the, the emissions are hugely skewed to a particular group of people. So the policies need to be aimed at the people that emit. So they're aiming policies at people who do not emit or have very small emissions. It's those that emit the lion's share of emissions where we should be aiming our policies. And that's really helpful, because then you can tailor the policies to them. So the first question is, who are they? Who are this group of people out there that are responsible for the lion's share of emissions? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> They give the most time scientists spend their time doing is having you know, um, essential conferences on, so on flights all around the world to pontificate about their work. Um, our missions are very high. Civil servants, NGOs, the question mark there, I don't know whether, I have no idea if any of you are in this group, but if you are, think about your own carbon footprint. I get an article with this sort of lecture to students, and, and they will say, well, I'm not in that group. No, but you're aspiring to be there, that's why you come to university. <laughs> If you take a long haul flight every year or two, that is indicative of your emissions, and they're almost certain you will be in the high emission category. 2 degrees centigrade, the carbon budget for 2 degrees centigrade, is a short term challenge. It's about what happens between now and 2025. So if our governments are talking about 2030, 2040, and 2050, they are being disingenuous or ignorant. What we are, when, we need to, when we need to think about climate change, we're saying what happens today, tomorrow, what are the policies for next week, the year after that, and really over just the next 10 years or so. Because beyond that point, we've blown the budget for two degrees C in any reasonable sense. It's a consumption issue, it's not a population issue. You often hear people using it, you know, saying, oh, sorry, it's all about the poor getting wealthy. It's rubbish, that. Just tell them to do some maths. The poor will not become wealthy enough in the time frame we have to deal with climate change for their emissions to really matter. Yeah. Just assume trickle-down economics works. It never happened in the history of humankind. Assume it works, and just assume the poor emissions grow at the average level of GDP, their emissions will still be low in 2015, no, 2020, rather, 2025, 2030. So over that time frame when we need to reduce emissions, the cause of emissions will not be significant. So it's down to people who are the ones who emit significantly today. So equity is a really hopeful way forward because we know who the emitters are and we need to tailor policies towards them. The only drawback, they are the policy makers. So it's the chickens and the, the foxes and the garden chicken coop. And Let's go to technology, which all sounds a bit more hopeful. There's a lot we can do with technology. I'm going to touch on two of these. Private road transport. And I gather from discussions yesterday that it is a slightly higher than this for Ireland. It's about, I was told there's 20% of emissions in, in Ireland. Is that a good thing? I say, okay, your emissions from, this is from private, private cars, not including freight. All road transport. All road transport. Okay, this is cars. Okay, because the HDV obviously on top would be on top of this, and like with vehicles, I'm not including this as either. So okay, so it's 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 that sort of ballpark, possibly a little bit higher. We have North American density as well as European density. Okay, yeah. Spacious. Yeah. Um, there are now there are over 300 models of cars. Those these are petrol and diesel cars that are less than 100 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer, and they have no price premium. They look like normal cars. They take three children seats in the back. They do the same speeds as all the ordinary cars, at least legally anyway. Um, you know, they, they fit every normal category of the cars, except for sports SUV vehicles, as I was pointing out. They're not necessary for anyone except for men with small egos. Um, so I'm sure none of you would have those. Um, so every category of car is covered. 
by vehicles at 100 grams. And yet, if you go outside here, the average car in Ireland, I'm guessing, is about near, near 170 grams. That's on the road. The average car being sold is probably near 130, 140, because of the EU requirement for fleet average cars in the EU to be near 130 grams. They're still way above cars that are available today at 85 to 100 grams that are just petrol and diesel, not even a and, uh, hybrid or electric. Two thirds of all car travel is travelled by cars that are under eight years old, eight years old and under other. Um, and so that you think about that, if you put in a maximum CO2 standard, which obviously would have clerks and screaming and the Daily Mail as well in the UK, and if you had a maximum CO2 standard for, for petrol and diesel cars, or, or cars, just forget that you, you, you can be non-specific non about the technology, at no additional capital cost, not cost you any more money, you just replace them at the natural replacement rate, reduced operating costs, because you need much, much less fuel net, so the operating costs have gone down, Identical infrastructure, same roads, same fuel stations. I believe you have fewer fuel stations because you're you know, about to get quite a price so much fuel. Same employment by the same companies. It's the same companies that make all the same cars, make the inefficient ones and the, uh, um, the ego enhancing ones. So you, oops, you put all of that together, you have about a 50 to 70% reduction from this supposedly intractable sector in about 10 years at no cost, at no, with no new technology required. Simply, all you simply require there is to put in a maximum CO2 standard and then ratchet it up year on year, given a very clear market signal. That's all you require. And we're not even bothered, not even prepared to do that. That shows how much, again, we care about climate change. Refrigerators are the same, I'm not going to go through in detail, but an A++ refrigerator for the same size uses about 80% less energy than the A rated refrigerator. So if you phase out all the A ones, and of course many of us in our homes are probably worse than A, at the normal replacement rate, there or thereabouts, you're looking at sort of like a 40 to 60 percent reduction in emissions again in about 10 years. Refrigerators and freezers in the UK represent the largest consumption within the domestic sector next to heating. I'm guessing that's probably not too dissimilar yeah, to here. Yeah, 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 next to yeah, next to yeah, next to heating yeah, okay. as well. But next to the heating side of the homes, I think this is the biggest consumer. Um, and just think about this: if you want um, to keep some. Guinness, you don't keep Guinness chilled. Oh, keep it gently chilled. <laughs> I'm, I'm a British ale man, which means a bit of room temperature. But then if you want a glass of cold white wine or whatever, you, um, or your lettuce, or whatever, to keep chilled, you need a fridge, and that's measured as an A-rated fridge, and therefore you need some electricity, and you need a transmission distribution network to get the power to the fridge. And you're home, you need the power station, and you need the Qatarians to get the gas out of the ground, or recently we've been buying coal from America because they've got shale gas revolution, so we've been burning that coal. Um, so if you then put into that, say we want 10 units of useful refrigeration, and we have an A-rated fridge, then actually we have to put a whole load more energy into that fridge because it's not very efficient. I mean, that's better if we have an AA one, but we have in this case, it's got an A++. It's got an A++. Here we just have an A-rated fridge, so a lot of electricity goes into the fridge. You're going to lose somewhere between 6 and 8% of the um, energy in the transmission network and distribution network, most of it in the low-voltage distribution stuff, the stuff that goes underground. The pylons are very efficient, but quite long distance travel, so, yeah. But what's your voltage? Is it a quarter of a million or is it higher? 440 kilovolts, the, the pylons. Yeah, the, yeah, the, high, yeah, the, the pylons are yeah, 440, okay. So that'd be, that'd be low, low loss then. Pretty low loss. So it's a distribution network in cities and towns that make a big difference. Stuff that's underground and low voltage. Um, power stations are constrained by thermodynamics, despite the fact some politicians seem to forget this. Um, yeah, I, I, I won't say who it was, but one of the UK politicians once said about jet engines, it was a very senior politician. Um, so that one day the engineers were about to make jet engines 100% efficient. Now, I'm sure he was really good on Shakespeare plays and Greek, but didn't know anything about physics or the second law of thermodynamics. 100% efficient jet engine. Um, so power stations are between, 55, uh, between 35 and 55% efficient, roughly. Most of the power in a power station, most of the energy goes up the chimney. And then you've got to get the stuff out of the ground and move it around the world. That, that is a very significant energy penalty as well. The point I'm just going to say here is if you're interested in, um, in trying to reduce our emissions, we shouldn't be just focusing on power stations. The actual demand side offers you massive potential, very early, at almost no cost. And we have chosen to do nothing about it. So again, this shows our level of concern for our children. And indeed, for our own future, because I'm hoping we'll do the stem cell research to still be here in 2050. Um, so the final thing we're going to look at is growth. What matters to us in life? Health, life expectancy, literacy rates, security. You can put your own list here. Fairness, fun, time with your family and your friends. These are the things that matter to you. If I asked you um, what was important in your life, you would probably wouldn't tell me things that had a pound sign or a euro sign next to them. 
not necessarily quite a sad individual. <coughs> You'd probably say it was your you know, love for your parents or your children or the, you know, the fun holiday you had with your friends last year. These are the things that really matter to us in life. And yet, we don't value those. We never put a pound sign. I mean, do, do you love your mom? Five love units and your children two love units? If you've got two kids, which one's worth more to you than the other? We would never dream of doing that. That'd be a category of the state of philosophy. And yet economists come along and do that all the time. They take the world that we live, the heterogeneous rich world that's awash with, with different forms of value, some are quantitative, some are not quantitative, and they certainly aren't substitutable. They convert them all into the same units, and then they are substitutable. You can swap the value of a car park for the love for your children. And that's what economists do all the time now. Neoclassical economists, the environmental branch, that feed into the sort of analysis that we're thinking about here. Growth itself has no meaningful value. We need to look at the things themselves and value them in that way. Sometimes they have metrics. You can measure things and measure them relative to their appropriate metric. Other things don't have values in that formal sense, and we shouldn't be valuing them then. We should be, we should be using them in, in text-based form, in paragraphs that explain what's important about them. Um, but beyond that, I think what's really helpful is the economist's economy has stalled. And this is really, you know, to me, this is quite good news. Um, temporarily, it's not good news, obviously, because a lot of people suffer. The consequence is generally poor people. Um, but the reason that the economy has collapsed is not because of green taxes and things like that. In fact, Alan Greenspan, I think it's interesting, and he's a, when he was interviewed, um, when he was in a uh, Senate hearing, at uh, the previous head of the Federal Reserve, so one of the most eminent economists in the world, <coughs> um, he said that he found a fundamental flaw in his model. Markets do not self-regulate. Now, if any of you have got a pet poodle, or a cat, or a budget guard, it will know that markets do not self-regulate. But the head of the Federal Reserve, and indeed the head of many advisors to government, are not aware that markets do not self-regulate. Um, a fundamental flaw in his model, that's interesting, it was a fundamental flaw, which is the minor aside. Um, neoclassical free markets are in disarray. They cannot explain what has happened and what is still happening. They, they provide us no guidance at all. You just listen to them on the news and you'll get a different response from each person you bring on there. You would never get that in any other area of physics, any other area of science or academic endeavour. Um, so it's certainly quantitative endeavour, which this, this discipline claims to be. But also, the approaches that it has put in to deal with climate change, whether that's the reason offsetting, CDM, clean development mechanism, joint implementation, <coughs> um, the emissions trading scheme, all of these systems that are basically market sort of based systems of one sort or another have fundamentally failed. We've had a quarter of a century to play with these, and we've got nowhere with them. So they, they themselves have not delivered the sorts of changes that are necessary as incremental approaches. So we have, and I, and I think it's quite an upbeat thing, we have, an, we have an unprecedented opportunity to think differently. Both because we are facing a problem that has systemic challenges that, we, that are very different from anything we've faced before, and secondly because the tools that we would normally have to address these sort of issues um, are no longer appropriate. Why would you ever use marginal economics, which is what neoclassical economics is? It's about small changes in a system that hardly changes around it, if you look at it theoretically. Why would you use that to address changes that are systemic and non-marginal, in other words, large? You would never use um, Newtonian theories to understand quantum mechanics. So why is it we think we can use marginal economics to understand non-marginal changes in society? It was completely inappropriate to be applying it, and yet we apply it in every government department. Um, in most of the industrialised parts of the world. So coming towards the end here, we are serious about two degrees centigrade, and bear in mind this is not a safe temperature threshold. We were really talking about an outside chance of this very dangerous threshold. We need deep reductions in energy demand. We know what sort of percentage they need to be, and we know by whom, and we know by what sort of time frame. So that quantitatively be incredibly clear. And we can deliver all of that. Just one thing that's interesting there, if, if the 10% of people around the globe who are responsible for 50% of the emissions they reduce their average emissions from the 25 to 30 tons per person that they are at the moment down to the average European around about 10 tons there or thereabouts, that would be a one-third reduction in global emissions that could be achieved in a year with no one being impoverished to the level less than the average European. Now most people would argue the average European is not too poor. And that's all we require to have a third reduction almost overnight. So it's not, this is not a challenge really for us when we think about it. We also need, I mentioned massive, the Marshall style, but we need a, a Marshall style build program of, of zero carbon energy supply. That has to go hand in hand with the, with the first one. If you put those two together, um, and we aim for 100% penetration um, of the energy system, the energy system by 2050, then I think you've got an outside chance of 2 degrees centigrade. So, some quick thoughts on, on, on the island at the end. Um, and uh, don't shoot me for these, because there's obviously on the other side of the water, and I uh, don't know enough about Ireland, but these are some quick thoughts here. 
Um, you have 1.7 million homes in Ireland, there or thereabouts. 1.2 million of those probably will be here, that there or thereabouts again, will be here in 2050. Um, if you retrofitted those with deep retrofit, now I'm assuming here at 40,000 euros a shot. Now, in the moment, if it's individual, it's going to cost quite a lot more than that. But I think if you're rolling this out, that seems a reasonable level. And admittedly, I would guess that I would be like the UK, the construction industry is not up to that at the moment. Our level of training is not good enough for people to do this. And that needs to be improved very significantly. But over 15 years, that's £3 billion pounds a year. That's 1.3% of your GDP. Um, that is excellent training um, for people to have very long term employment doing this sort of work over the next 15 or 20 years. They will be highly skilled by, you know, within a few years of doing this. And, that's, and you have 9% unemployment. Now, I don't know what your, construct, what your unemployment um, the structure of unemployment is, but I guess it's quite a few of them are relatively unskilled. And if that's the case, then they are people that can very easily be skilled up and have good supervision to do the retrofit agenda. It also will eliminate fuel poverty, which is 200 to 300,000 homes in, in Ireland. And if we really care about people in fuel poverty, I don't know whether we do or not, but if we assume that we do, then that could very significantly, if not eliminate fuel poverty. It also makes us all um, resilient to volatile fuel prices, which are, uh, undoubtedly will be the case as we go forward if we carry on using um, fossil fuels. It also makes our homes resilient to a changing climate as well, if we do it well. So there are lots of, you know, this, there are, I don't think there are that many win-win opportunities, but this is a win-win-win-win opportunity. And are we doing it? Of course we're not. We'd rather give the money to the banks and quantitative easing. It's interesting in the UK, the quantitative easing in the UK was 375 billion. You could have retrofitted the housing stock in the UK that would be here in 2050 for 200 billion, and you could have still given the chance for 175 billion to squander amongst his banking friends. Um, so you could have actually managed to achieve very significant levels of retrofit and put the money back into the economy um, as part of a sort of a greening QE, but we chose not to go down that route. Maximum CO2 standard for electrification, uh, uh, for cars and a huge electrification program. Because if you're going to deal with climate change, you have to electrify much of the energy system. Because the only vectors, energy vectors outside of electricity that are low carbon, that I can really think of as viable here, are biomass and biofuel, and they have to be grown sustainably, and they're, they're not always low carbon, but they can be, and, and hydrogen. And hydrogen generally is produced through electrification, possibly through, uh, through elect electrolysis, possibly through thermal decomposition and stuff. Efficiency standards on all appliances, borrow, borrow the top one in approach from, from Japan, which has been very successful, requiring under a series of appliances for, the, for, the, best, for the, the new average to be the same as the best that was available before, and you continually update that. That has been very successful in, 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 um, in uh, Japan, and of course you can start that with government procurement in Ireland, which I don't know how large that is, but I guess that's a reasonable size. If you put all of that together, I think you could power down the demand system by 40 to 70 percent without radically changing the quality of life of people living within our society. That doesn't mean to say that the few of us at the top of the income, I wouldn't say top in terms of our society, but in terms of our income, we will see significant changes in how we have to live our lives. And we will no doubt just um, think of those ourselves as being detrimental to us. But for the majority of people in our society, this could be delivered without huge changes to the quality of life. But for people like me and probably most of us here, we would see very significant changes as to how we have to live our lives, at least until we have low carbon supply in place. As I said before, a major electrification program, heating, perhaps in the rural environments here, you could be looking at, um, at ground source heat pumps. In the rural environments, in the cities, you may be looking at district heating, combined heat and power schemes, possibly air source heat pumps. Um, and also electrifying transport. I gather you've already got a fairly good network of, um, of uh, charging sites around the, around the island, but you only have about 1,000 cars doing it, which is, you know, you've got one and not the other, it seems a little bit foolish, so you need to always find some way of rolling that out. Um, you can't overplay smart grids, but smart grids, and I don't just mean meters on the, on the, you know, on the kitchen that tells how much energy you use there, they're, they're, they're just less dumb meters, or dumb, less dumb grids. You have proper smart grids where the supplier communicates directly with the refrigerator, with the washing machine, and the dishwasher if you have one. Um, in terms of metering and community energy, all these are things that we should be pursuing. And the early phase out of your three peak stations, which are is it 300 megawatts there or thereabouts, I think, for the, for the three peak stations, you have a wealthy nation with huge renewable potential. Now, you know, that should be brought into play. And I'm saying this, because I've made the same argument except for Pete, for the UK as well, um, and indeed for Norman. So we should be very rapidly um, moving towards renewables. We should not be building any more fossil fuel plants at all. We should be only going down a, a zero carbon or very low carbon route. Um, solar panels on roofs, obviously extending this in the UK, assuming your weather patterns or your irradiance um, is very similar to that in the UK, which is possibly a little bit different. Um, it's a slightly better one. Well, there you go. Well, that's, that's interesting. 
Is that, is that a tourist then? Attraction. We know it's dry weather and sunny. Is it you've got less cloud cover? Actually, it has to be very sunny. Where do you need it? On the east coast. Yeah. West coast is different. Oh, is it? Oh, that's it. That's really good. Right. Yeah. Is the wine valley? Right, so solar panels on southwest facing roofs. If you did that to all your domestic properties, I'm making, I'm extrapolating this in the UK's Department of Energy and Climate Change and Energy Pathway tool, which is a really good tool to play with. Maybe you've got something similar in Ireland. That would give you about a third of electricity demand in Ireland would be met by solar panels. Okay, you've got intensity issues with that, but you can say very reliably what that will be year on year and what the cost will be. You can't do that for fossil fuels. You've no idea what the cost of gas will be next year. We do know the cost of sunlight for energy. Um, and you've got huge potential because although you don't have very many clouds, occasionally you have clouds <coughs> and occasionally they release some moisture into the atmosphere, otherwise it must be painted as in green because it's like a nice green country. Um, so you still have night. Hmm? You still have night. Yeah, still have night. <laughs> <laughs> it rains there as well. So you went into this biogas and biogas and biogas. I think you could be growing a lot of uh, biomass and bio, uh, biomass within Ireland. Um, now there are lots of issues around that, but if you use that, you can imagine applying that to help the tissue deal with issues of intermittency, which are much overplayed anyway. Once you start to electrify heating, once you start to electrify cars, and once you start to have some sort of, um, some sort of intelligent metering system in your homes, you can start to actually reduce issues of intermittency anyway. But nevertheless, you're going to have some periods where you'll have to have things like um, some sort of backup there. But also, again, at the end of the day, demand-side management, if you put that in there as well, for a few days in the year when you don't have sufficient supply, you may have to look at some demand-side management. And uh, having come over here by ferry, um, which is a fairly, um, fairly polluting form of transport in terms of the, the bond you got at the moment. Um, could you think about ferries that were fueled by something different? And there's already work being done. There's danger that Danes already are running hybrid ferries over there. So there's lots of things you can do there. And some touches on policy. Uh, one of the things you need to do is stop rebound effect, particularly in the efficiency where people just spend the money on a digital flight or um, some more goods. So in the UK, for instance, we've seen a significant improvement in the efficiency of lighting, and yet lighting today has the same number of tech consumed, still 17 terawatt hours that it did to 10 or 15 years ago. No change, because we now just heat the We just light outside our house. We have more lights in our home. If you go into our kitchen, it's full of light, light sockets all over the kitchen. You know, you know, 10 halogens rather than having you know, one light in the middle that we used to always have. So we, we don't generally save energy when, we, um, when we're more efficient. We just generally spend it somewhere else. So you have to overcome that. So if you must start making progressive metering tariffs, in other words, the more you consume, the more you pay per unit, you can overcome some of the rebound effects. And it's much more equitable than as I gather you have in Ireland, it's the same in the UK at the moment, the poor pay the most per unit of energy. Yeah. So yeah, and again, it's quite sad that that's the case. Um, I want to flip to the next two very quickly. This is obviously this will be slightly um, controversial. A moratorium on hydrocarbon developments. Yeah, we're serious about climate change. <coughs> no shale gas, no offshore oil gas on Ireland. We should also close them down in the UK. So I make the same arguments there and in Norway as well. You have a massive renewable potential. You're one of the wealthiest countries in Europe. You've got a very educated population. And if we're serious about climate change, we are the countries that should be the exemplars. We should be leading by example, demonstrating what is necessary for Paris, rather than finding every excuse under the sun to do nothing. Um, we serve a moratorium and airport expansion. And I haven't touched here agriculture. You've noticed. 33% of your emissions from agriculture. My understanding is there are many, many things you could do to significantly reduce your emissions from agriculture. And to be blunt, if you don't want to renege on Paris, you're going to have to do a lot about your agriculture as well. Not just here, but obviously other parts of the world as well. Um, so agriculture emissions will have to be very seriously reduced. We are serious about our Paris Agreement. And, and I put in there finally a personal carbon allowance. It's, well, I'm not saying we have to think about that as an approach, but it's one way you can motivate, and it, well, we think we can motivate and engage wider citizenship engagement in these issues, some people think it's fairer, and it's much better than a carbon tax for driving innovation, which requires the wealthy to drive the innovation process, which is what they normally do, as a carbon tax allows them to buy their way out of it. So that you, with a carbon allowance, you cannot buy your way out of a certain proportion of your emissions. So I think, oh, oh I'm going to finish off. Um, I heard the criticism recently about this, as I was finished off with this as a too upbeat. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, I was interesting, so I must have to rethink this. I've been using this quote for years without paying any royalties. In fact, one of my colleagues at work, for my 50th, got a breadboard for me with this, get, with this etched into the breadboard. Because <laughs> uh, I sort of all use it. Um, at every level, the greatest obstacle to transforming the world is that we lack the clarity and imagination to conceive that it could be different. Now, I don't mean to leave that as a, oh, we're all going to be fine. What I'm trying to say here is that. 
if we are really serious about our commitment to climate change, and by that, we of course, climate change is something abstract. What I'm really saying is if we're really serious about our commitment to our own children, our own society, and those elsewhere on the planet, that's what we're really saying, then we have to think of a very different world. The world will be fundamentally different than it is today, either because we have chosen to act on climate change, or because we have actively chosen not to act on climate change and hand the repercussions to our kids. And indeed, some of us will probably still be here. 2030, 2040, So we have to have imagination to think of a different future. But that's not good enough. Policymakers need some clarity around that to say, well, what would that look like? We need to be able to paint a very clear picture for policymakers of the alternatives and the options that are available. And we have that intellectual capacity within our societies. We have the technical capacity, technical capacity to deliver change. We have the innovative capacity to come up with new policies and social change as well. If you put all of that together, what I'm trying to suggest here is that we can still hold to an outside chance of 2 degrees C, but every day we fail, it gets more difficult, and very soon from now, 2 degrees C will be too late. Um, so thank you very much for listening.